How many of you just love winning? Isn't it the best? I mean, there's a whole hashtag, hashtag winning. You know, we just love winning. Uh, we love it when the Dodgers go to the World Series and win, or the Angels, whatever your thing is. Uh, we love it when the Rams go to the Super Bowl and win. Haven't had that recently, but let's not get distracted. Uh, we love it when we win, especially when we play the Raiders. I'm just messing with you. I'm just playing. Just playing. I already had someone text me from another service, go Raiders, okay, I see you. Um, and uh, we, are, we just love winning. Uh, we love winning in our marriages, uh, those of us who have them. We love winning in life, uh, in spiritual growth, in our ministries, in our professions. Winning is the best. Matter of fact, we sometimes sing this chorus in church, it goes like this, everything is awesome, everything, we don't sing that one. Well, I mean, it's, it's a great chorus. Um, whether or not it's from the Lego movie or not is irrelevant, but uh, we just love winning. We love the scripture that God leads us always in triumph in Christ. And yet the word triumph in and of itself seems to indicate like something had to be overcome, like there was struggle, but then we can modify our theology a little bit to say, well, yes, because Jesus has won it all, and so he's just now kind of pulling my wagon. And I sit back in my Christian walk, and he pulls me, and everything is awesome. <laughs> we love the feeling of it. It validates us. It makes us feel like what I'm doing is actually working. Um, but the problem is, is it doesn't feel like I always win. As a matter of fact, there's some very particular seasons where it feels like I'm doing the opposite. It's like I'm doing all this activity, trying to look cool, but it's like the moonwalk. And no, I will not be demonstrating the moonwalk, but it's all this activity, but you're actually moving backwards. And there are seasons like that. Okay, so uh, I know that the last time that I was here, I talked about how that Jesus turned to the first two people who started following him, and actually challenged them, gave them a qualifying question and said, why are you following me? And that the, any other answer than we want to be with you, which is actually what they said, because at first it was like, what are you talking about? Where are you staying? He didn't ask you that, right? He, he asked you, what are you seeking? A very existential question. And uh, so at that point, I was kind of Pastor Buzzkill. Um, and so he's back. <laughs> Pastor Buzzkill's back. Um, because what I hope that we will do this morning is give some voice to the seasons of backward, the seasons of what seem like loss. Uh, we don't have very good handles for that in our Western culture and in the church at large, and when we don't look like we're winning, we actually want to hide as opposed to be vulnerable and open, and I'm going to get into it, okay? So I hope it's like a pair of glasses that is hanging in your tool belt. Uh, some of us who are of a certain age, uh, you know, you have readers and you have prescription lenses and you have this other set of glasses over here and then you have the ones for sitting in front of the computer and, all, and, so all, and just live long enough and you'll get there. But <laughs> the Lord has given us a lot of different tools in, in our spiritual lives, and I want to talk about one that doesn't get a lot of air uh, these days, but if we do it right, you will be able to successfully navigate one of the most difficult situations in your life, and if we do it really right, you'll be able to help somebody else who's walking through it to help them navigate through it. So for this, we will now go to the book of Ecclesiastes. Now, in previous services, I have said turn to the book of Ecclesiastes and heard a couple of groans, uh, because Ecclesiastes is what we call wisdom literature. That's the genre, the type of book that it is in the Bible. And wisdom literature sometimes poses questions or makes statements that seem like, that doesn't sound very Christian to say, everything is vanity, nothing matters. It, I dud all this stuff and it doesn't work. Uh, like, why am I in discipleship? Why am I giving? Why am I coming to church? Nothing feels like it works. Well, you just have to keep reading. 
Okay, so don't start in Ecclesiastes and then just stop somewhere. You've got to get to the end where he gives the moral of the story. Okay, so I don't have time to teach Ecclesiastes. Well, this is the last service, right? I can go as long as I want, right? Isn't that, is that how it works? It's like the Saturday night crew. It's like, you got nowhere else to be. Um, all right, Ecclesiastes 3.1, here's what it says. To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. All right, I think that we should all read that together. Ready? To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. And I don't know if I mentioned it, but I, I, I'm a professor, I teach, and so sometimes I have to repeat some things. And you repeat them, and that's like double the learning, and it gets, it gets locked in. So are you ready? So to everything, there's a season. Okay, so everything has a season. And a season, just like baseball, is not forever. It may seem longer. I don't know, but the baseball season seems long. Okay? Um, the, even the basketball season is pretty long. 80-some-odd games or something like that? I don't know. I'm not that committed uh, to it. But... It's, it's long. Uh, and check this out. A time for every purpose under heaven. So every season has a, a purpose. It has a time. It has a length, a duration. And it has a purpose. Now, I know because I know the book of Romans in Romans chapter 8 that in every season, God is working all things together for the good of those who love him and are the called according to his purpose. But what about a season that I'm walking through where there's no evidence that God's doing anything, and perhaps even that maybe God is not as good as I thought he was, or I'm not experiencing God in the way that I was told he should be experienced, what do I do now? Okay, and you're already excited to hear it. I can hear it all over your, your interactions. Okay, look with me in Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, Paul is writing, and he said, Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am. By the way, he's not talking about Nebraska versus Florida versus California. Whatever state mentally, emotionally, spiritually, whatever state I'm in, to be content. Now, how many of you know there's a difference between content contentedness and happiness? Happiness is fleeting. Contentedness is a decision that I've made that I'm not going to be, uh, to use another Paul phrase, blown about by every wind, right? I'm not going to be like a, a reed shaken in the wind, which Jesus said about John the Baptist. It's, it's not what I'm going to be. Okay, so I know some of us have like scriptures on refrigerators and such like this. I'm going to wager, see, I did clean that up because you can't say, I bet, because that wouldn't be right. So I wager, is that better? Is that cleaner? Um, I, I wager that no one has the next scripture on your refrigerator. I know how to be abased. Yeah, everything is awesome when I'm abased. And someone's going, well, what does abased mean? Well, it means lowered. It means that is not a season where I'm getting all the attention and all the praise, all the affirmation, all of the good feelings. This is a season where I mm, am not getting the signals that I normally get. I'm not getting the affirmation that I normally get. Paul said, content. Content. I know how to abound. Now, maybe that part you've got on your refrigerator. I'm abounding. Every door is open before me. God has opened doors before me that no man can shut. And, and he leads me always in triumph of Christ. And, all, and we, we know all of that. That's the one we want. We don't want to think about the abased part. I did, mm -mm. And I don't want to have to learn how to be content in it either because I don't like that season. I don't want to be that way. And then he keeps talking. Don't you love it when Paul just keeps talking? Everywhere and in all things. I have learned. Now I want you to notice Paul learned it. He wasn't born this way. He didn't just pop out of his mom and go, I'm content. No, you know how babies are, don't you? Wah! <laughs> Feed me. Wah! Change my diaper. Wah! And all that attention that comes with a baby. But how many of you moms know in particular, um, at, at some point, you need to stop wearing diapers. 
You know, might be fun for a while. Someone changes me. Someone feeds me. Someone answers me every time I call and all that. And, you know, you get older, start wearing diapers again, and it's not as fun anymore. <laughs> not as fun. I don't know yet, but I can see that, you know, that day may come at some point. Paul said, I have learned both to be full. Yes, I'm full on the Lord. I'm, I'm full of his goodness. He's by, beside me and before me and behind me in front of me and in all the dimensions. And to be hungry. Hey, what? what? <laughs> Say what? No, he satisfies my mouth with goodness. He's like, yeah, I remember that. Now I'm hungry. I'm content. As a matter of fact, some of you are so content in hunger, you get what's called hangry. You're like, yeah, and this is the service that would do it, right? This is the one who's right around the lunch hour. Hurry up. Be content, my brothers and sisters. The scripture has said it. Both to abound, check out this part, and to suffer need. Those aren't the seasons that get a lot of play in our sermons uh, sometimes in podcasts because it's just longer form and you can talk about more. Uh, but these seasons that happen in the life of a Christian um, have a call from the Lord with how to navigate them. We don't like talking about them. We don't like preaching. They, they don't make for like happy, happy preaching. And some of you are like, and that's what I came here today for, happy, happy preaching. But if I can help you understand both maybe a season you walk through that you still don't know what was going on, and maybe one that you are currently walking through, and I'm going to give some real words and language to the season to help you. And I know, it, I know it will register because there's been a line of people at the end of the service telling me, oh, I never heard it, and I just heard it. That's going to be some of you today. And some of you are going to walk into that season, and it's going to be disorienting and you're not going to know what to do with it, but today you're going to learn what to do with it. All right. Uh, I have a friend who's a house church leader, and she's a real artist and everything, and she uses art like a verb. She says, I'm going to art now. I'm arting. And so in this next piece of my personal art, uh, withhold judgment. It's one of those that you have to look at and then have someone tell you what it means. Um, but I spent like 30 seconds drawing this. So uh, let's have a look at it. <laughs> and you're like, oh, it's a hairdo. Okay, got it. Got it, it's a hairdo. Uh, this represents a cycle, a season in your life. Okay, so a whole human life, this would just continue over and over again. Born that day, died that day, and it just goes up and down like this. Okay, and so this is part of life. You're excited already. Um, we meet Jesus, and let, let me back up to say this. Um, as someone who's in biblical studies, and I read a lot of church fathers and mothers and church history, and I notice something that they were picking up on that hadn't been given real voice in my Christian upbringing. And um, a, a guy made it really popular was this guy called St. John of the Cross. I wish I could give myself a cool name like that, but um, he, in the 15th century, he gave voice to a lot of things that the church fathers and mothers had written over time at this people, uh, about this cycle that people go through that love Jesus and are walking with Jesus, and they have these seasons where there's... They come to Jesus, and most of us, when we came to Jesus, we came in this downward part over on your left. It was a crisis moment. Most of us don't come to Jesus when we have the most money and we got the most fame and fortune and everything's going well. It is a well-documented thing called a crisis moment. When we realize that our life is not our own, that everything we've been trying has not worked, uh, th life is going to hell in the proverbial handbasket, and we cry out. Jesus, if you're there, God, if you're real, get a message through somehow, some way, and he saves us. And he saves us and gives us all this beautiful data from scripture that is actual reality about now we're a new creation. 
The old is gone. The new has come. I'm now the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus and all this. And here's what we know about the physiology and the chemistry of the human body. Some truths and some uh, input give us stuff like endorphins and dopamine and the happy, happy feelings. Jesus knows that, but he, he wasn't surprised when the scientists are, oh, look at this. God's like, did, did I do that? You don't, no, he, he did it. He knew what he was doing. But Jesus wins us. This is what the, for 1,500 years or better they studied that he captures us with something called the milk of consolation. This, you're a newborn baby, we're gonna, I'm going to take care of you, I'm going to wash you. You, you. There's a plan for your life, you're filled with purpose, you're filled with passion, and wow, you are off like a rocket. I know Pastor Jerry's been in the Philippines, and I think he's going to Albania, and I think he's negotiating with SpaceX to get to Mars, to, t- <laughs> to, to take Jesus' disciple to the Martians. Um, I, I don't know what I think about Martian theology, but you know we'll, we'll figure it out when we get there. Uh, but uh, we are off like a rocket, and it is beautiful. It's exciting. We are like walking into a Beyond service. You know, the young adults when they're here and they're jumping up and down. I usually don't. I don't like jumping up and down as much because once I stop jumping, things still jiggle, and um, and that takes me right out of the spirit. But. Um, <laughs> Like, who wants to, I'm going to go into this next season. Uh, But, I mean, it is awesome during this time. Everything feels possible. Uh, Even if there's persecution that comes from maybe an old friend group or something, as we've chosen to follow Jesus, all the goodness is so good, we just lock into Jesus. You know, dopamine and endorphins can be the, the, the seed ground of addiction, Right? Matter of fact, all the app developers know this, especially the pay-to-play app developers know that very well. For you to keep winning, you have to keep upgrading your equipment, you know, your new gear for your uh, call of duty or whatever in order to be able to keep owning the other side and winning. The only way you can keep winning is by spending more money. They know it. They know it very well, and they're sapping a lot of our income uh, doing that, income the Lord gave us to prosper us and and, and such like that. Well... In consolation, we're not thinking about any of that, man. We are we. This is that's that's the we season. But then we start walking out the Christian life. Things kind of even out. Some of us are during this long season up here. We're like, uh, you remember that revival back in 1962? Oh, those were the good old days. That's when preaching was good. That's when the Spirit was allowed to move and all this kind of stuff. And we are uh, on another kind of drug called nostalgia, uh, which is very powerful and reinterprets things to make them rosier than they actually were. But that's another sermon for another time. Uh, But we start memorizing scriptures more like, "Mm, I walk by faith and not by sight. Or, um, you know, those that endure to the end, the same will be saved. That's, That's what you do in this season here. And then you start serving in kids' ministry, for instance. And you go back there and you find out that kids are maybe not the easiest people to, you know, be in ministry with and to serve. And maybe they don't want to be served. And, and, uh, and you're just kind of like, okay, I sure would like to, everything is awesome. Where is that? Where did that go? Or you're an usher. And uh, you want to give people the very best seat, the one that serves them the best, and they don't want to sit there. And, you know, and, and so those kinds of things happen. But then this next thing happens. Now, this next thing may seem exciting to some of you people who need therapy. Um, and, and I remember this, this next season is like when I was, I don't know, second grade. Um, we were living in southern Oklahoma. We drove down to Six Flags Over Texas in Arlington. And um, there was this roller coaster called the Judge Roy Scream Scream was in there for a reason. Um, it prophesied to me. And, and yea, verily, I did fulfill such uh, call-outs. Uh, so uh, I don't know back in those days, back in the olden days, um, if there was a must-be-this-high-to-ride kind of a thing. Because somehow or other, not on this part, that wasn't as bad as the 
the drop. You know the drop where you feel like you're coming out of your seat? I don't like that. I don't like it at all. Uh, I joined the army for a reason. It's on the ground. It's on the ground. And um, you know, my son joined the Air Force. God bless you. Go on, go on boy. Uh, but I am not... I have to fly to Orlando early, uh, later this week to meet my wife somewhere, and um, uh, I'm, I, you will find me <laughs> holding on for dear life. Jesus, take the wheel. Take, you know, I mean, all that. Okay, so when this season here comes, oh, I should finish that story. Uh, when we went down that, I slid down under the bar and was in the floorboard of this thing, and my teenage uncle at the time going, oh, hey, ah! <laughs> trying to hold on to me because I could fall out of this thing, but you know, so yeah, I don't like that part. Okay, here's what I want to tell you today. Uh, first of all, let, let's just, let me examine something. Let's go to the next slide for a second. The theologians call this a season of consolation and a season of desolation. Oh, you, you really like that last, for, that last word, don't you, huh? that desolation? That's something you're like, man, I was thinking about getting a tattoo. I think desolation would be a good one. <laughs> yeah, sarcasm is just one of my gifts, but we'll get to that, okay? We'll get to that. I learned some things about sarcasm in a season of desolation. Um, the theologians call this the dark night of the soul or a dark night of the senses. In other words, all the feelings I was getting in consolation when I came to the Lord are now gone and I can't sense things. I can't sense God. It's like I can't hear him. I'm reading my Bible, and there are words there, but it, it's not like it was in the season of consolation when God was, oh, there, there it is. Woo! I, he's reading my mail. He knows exactly who I am and where I, he, these words are prophesying to me, and now I'm looking at it, and I don't feel nothing. I got nothing. But I'm only in this framework where to be excited all the time means I'm doing well as a Christian, right? I mean, think about how many times we hear the word, I'm so excited about, I'm so excited about. I kind of got a little, I, I do this, I get a little irritated with words and I'm like, I'll go to the thesaurus and find other ways to say I'm excited without having to say I'm excited all the time. Because it almost comes front-loaded expectation, if I'm not bouncing up and down, if I'm not raising my hands, if I'm not praying the loudest, if I'm not doing all this other kind of stuff, then I am not winning. See, in our social media age, that projected self, some of you therapists would know this word, the projected self is what we constantly put out there. But listen, that's nothing new. Jesus talked about it with the Pharisees, with their long garment, praying their long prayers. No one's seeing the background reels, right? No one's seeing what's going on in the dark. And desolation is in the dark. By the way, this, the title of this message is Transformed in the Dark. Transformed in the Dark. Let me tell you what happens in church. Over in a season of consolation, you got the people who are just, they're high on Jesus. Anyone ever remember that? Get high on Jesus. That was a very 60s and 70s thing to say. Wonder why. <laughs> um, <laughs> Get high on Jesus. In other words, replace that feeling you were getting before with this new feeling of Jesus. But what happens when that feeling is not there? Is Jesus still there? If the way I have been trained and understood and enculturated by the Western church, by and large, because we have no theology of suffering... As if that's a process sometimes decreed by God for the perfection of our souls. I'm dropping all the revelation up in here today. We have no, we have no construct for it. So when we get in this season, we come to church all acting like we're in consolation. And some of us are so much in desolation, we can't even fake consolation. And then we have people in consolation on this side looking at people to desolation going, oh, what happened to you? Is there sin in your life? And of course, over here in desolation, you want to look over the people in consolation and say, shut up. I'm sick of you people anyway. What, you got no problem? Oh, like you don't have sin in your life? 
right? This is something that can happen in a church, and people with desolation have no place to go and lament. They have no place to go and have someone other than Job's friends come along beside them. Listen, we, and this is, uh, this is where, and you know, Jonathan was in the previous service, so I'm like, all right, I got a dear man as a witness. Um, let me be very specific. We talk about praying the word. We talk about declaring things using the word and all of that. That is one tool that we have in our Christian tool belt. But there's also this time of desolation where the best thing we can do is say nothing. And by the way, uh, it's hard for God to get a word in edgewise when we're just trying to say the magic words to get back to the feelings instead of be still and know that I'm God. Be still and know that I'm God. So let's go to this next one. I'm just going to summarize these. So in consolation, God tends to us as newborn babies with the bottle of consolation. There's many good feelings and affirmation of our new reality in God's kingdom. Everything feels great and everything is great. This is part of the experience. It is wonderful. I got good news for you too. If you can get through a season of desolation, you're going to get back to consolation. How many of you walked out of a difficult season and then the freshness of the Lord, the glory of the Lord having brought you through that season brings you right back into... And eventually wears off a little bit, start walking by faith again. And then something happens, somebody happens, somebody says something. Or, as I'm going to show you in Scripture, God initiates a season of desolation. That's not what my Jesus does. My Jesus doesn't do that. I'm going to show you how he does. <laughs> Let's go. Let's go back to the Old Testament. See, I knew it. This Old Testament theology right here. This, this isn't Jesus. Well, you know, there are one. Okay, so by the way, in the New Testament, it talks about a son who is legitimate, who receives correction. Right? Oh, oh. Oh, you could have felt that drop in the room. All right. Uh, hey, do you guys remember the Exodus? Like even before that, when God's doing all the plagues, and there's this big standoff between Moses and Aaron and Pharaoh and all that, and woo, I mean, it was everything is awesome. Well, at least for the Israelites, it was awesome. It was really terrible for the Egyptians. But um, um, right after that, God led them into the wilderness three days and three nights with no bread or water. I mean, but that's cool. They had all the Egyptian gold, but there was no 7-Eleven, so they couldn't buy water. Um, three days and three nights, no bread or water. Kind of weird. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2. And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and to test you were you aware that God still tests hearts today? That he still is purifying our faith like fire? Like gold that is refined in fire? To know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. He says, hey, uh, no bread or water? Still going to obey me? No feeling, no sensation, you're standing in the dark and wondering if there is a good and benevolent God based on your current set of experiences. Does that, is that God really there? And what happens is for some people, they go into this thing that's very popular today. It's been given verbiage called deconstruction. It's where people are re... And by the way, there's some de good deconstruction that can happen where people jettison ridiculous traditions that have been handed down to them, stuff added to the gospel. And by the way, you want to point to some other religion and say, oh, they have all that. Pentecostals have it too. We have lots of traditions added to it that are extra to the gospel. It's not in there, right? But it makes us feel good. It makes that project itself look awesome. It looks like we're winning. Well, God leads us sometimes into the desert to show us who we are. Yay, I'll use a Robbie Booth thing here. Yay, <laughs> yay, God. I love all our teachers, each, each is a gift. So he humbled you and allowed you to hunger. 
<laughs> Pastor Carl, I asked God to humble me once. <laughs> One time. After he answered that prayer so profoundly, and I was thoroughly humbled, head shaved, wearing a uniform, standing a bunch of, a bunch of guys far away from home, having a guy in a Smokey the Bear hat, as a matter of fact, 22 Smokey the Bear hats. Oh, you think there's one drill sergeant. There's not. There's a whole company of them telling you who you are and who your mom is and all this kind of stuff. And yeah. So from that point forward, I said, Lord, help me humble myself. <laughs> but it's not an activity that I'm eager to get into humbling myself. So sometimes the Lord initiates a season of desolation. And if you don't know that God does that, and you enter one, you're going to go into a kind of deconstruction that can lead to destruction. You can start to question God's goodness and not know that there are seasons where he tests our heart. And sometimes those seasons are initiated by other stuff that happens. He did it, she did it, I did it, they did it, nobody did it, everybody did it, doesn't matter. We're in it. We're in, and denying it doesn't help. And by the way, trying to start rebuking the devil for everything doesn't help either because the devil's not the one who initiated it. Can you imagine that? I rebuke this spirit of condemnation. Can you imagine God standing there? I'm trying to convict you. I'm like the one trying to show you the sin that's in your heart to show you the idolatry that's in your heart so that you can serve me in greater fullness. So that you can understand my goodness as I show you who you really are. Now, we just, you know, it's like going to the doctor. There's some of you out there, you don't want to go to the doctor because you're afraid of what he'll say. Right? I'm going to talk to some of the therapists. There's a lot of, you know, people show up for counseling or they don't. Schedule the appointment and never show up because they're afraid of what they'll hear. They, we're actually afraid to look at ourselves. How many of you ever just... Drive the car with nothing on. I mean, like no radio, no playlist going, no nothing. For some people, that is, I mean, just, they, it's stressful. It's terrible because the voices that start speaking, you know, and, and sometimes the voice that speaks is like, well, that's got to be the devil. Why should I have to forgive? Why should I have to? And, you know, I've listened to some of the testimonies around here. Was with Pastor Jonathan talking about that season that he went through uh, where there was sickness with it. Did God cause the sickness? No. But it was a legitimate dark night of the senses because it's like, what is going on right now? By the way, that's a good question. Oh, the Scripture's got lots of it. Uh, David loves it. Habakkuk loves it. How long? How long? By the way, God's not afraid of your question. Matter of fact, he's kind of waiting for you just to communicate, yes. to ask him, how long? And sometimes the answer is, hang on. <laughs> That's what he told Habakkuk, wait. Yay. Right? Wait, I'm doing some things. That's the promise. In the darkness, in that stillness, I am doing a work. I love what he told Habakkuk. If I told you what it was, you wouldn't believe it. But I am doing a work. The just will live by their faith, right? Okay. Uh, sometimes David has this dark night of the soul, dark night of the senses in like three verses. It's like he's in consolation, then he's in desolation. He's in consolation, he's in desolation. It is in here. He's like, oh, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Oh, kill my enemies, Lord. They're seeking to kill me. Where are you? How long will you be here? And all this. And so uh, look at Psalm 42 with me just quickly. As the deer pants for the water brooks, as the deer panteth for the water. We write worship songs on this, and it's great. So pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? So we worship around that. I think it's appropriate, but look at verse 3. My tears have been my food day and night, while they continually say to me, where is your God? Listen, in a season of desolation, all of a sudden this voice starts coming around saying, where's Jesus now? <laughs> we, and maybe you've got unbelieving relatives 
who resent your decision to follow Jesus and like, oh yeah, where's Jesus now? Hmm? Where'd he go? Kind of feels like the prophets bail, you know, like or Elijah making fun of them. Is he on a vacation? Where'd he go? Right? Now check this out. This is interesting. Uh, when I remember these things, I pour out my soul within me, for I used to go, I used to go with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God. Listen to this proverb. A man isolates himself for his own desire and rages out against all sound judgment. In other words, when you get in a season of desolation, isolation is what feels good to get away from those happy, bouncy, raising their hands, praying in the spirit of people, because I'm trying all that and nothing's working. It's not working. It. What's not? What part of it is not working? The feelings. Dummy, I want to feel good again. I want to feel the happy, happy Jesus juice. I, I want to get back to that. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with the desire to get back to that, but the the insane pursuit of it at any cost. Some people in des desolation run back to the liquor cabinet. They go to what was prior to this giving me those feelings. See, those feelings before, you were getting them illicitly. You were getting it from stuff that uh, provided some dopamine and endorphin hits and all of their, their tests where they put dopamine buttons for rats in a little maze, and the, they punched that dopamine button until they committed suicide. Got to have it, got to have it, got to have it, got to have it. And Jesus is saying, there are going to be seasons when I pull back the milk of consolation to show you what's in your heart. And that is not a gospel many of us have heard. We think it, we're only right with God when we feel a certain way. Instead of, I'm right with God because of Jesus. Not because of my ability to do. Some people move into retirement and lose a whole sense of self because they're not doing the way they used to do. I used to pastor a campus. I had regular pastoral responsibilities in that season. And when I didn't have it anymore, it was a little different. A little sense of value. I remember... Um, this is now the second Easter. We just had one. That first Easter, when I'm sitting on my couch on a Sunday, and I got nowhere to preach, and for the last 25 years, I'd preach every Easter Sunday. It was a Christian high holy day. I love preaching on Easter and all that. And I sat there, and I'm like, ugh. And because I walked through desolation, I learned how to ask a question. Why is that important? Why is it important? That, that feeling that you're having now, why is that important? And you know what the answer was? Me, 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 me. No, it was about me. It was about me speaking to a group of people. It was about influence. It was a, even if it was 100 people. It doesn't matter. Just that greater level of influence and where I had been resourcing much of my self-worth and value. Oh, but that's Jesus, right? Not really. That was part of serving Jesus, but it ended up being a little bit more narcissistic. A little bit more like, I preach and it feels good. Even if there's resistance, there's a part of like, yeah, still, it was the truth, you know. Uh, I didn't learn that in consolation. I learned it in desolation. Because I don't hear as well in consolation because I don't need to hear anything. Everything is awesome. <laughs> If the Holy Spirit wanted to make an appointment to talk to me about sin, he's not going to really be able to do it in consolation. Because I know everything's cool. Obviously, I'm winning. All right, let me drop a little revelation here, and let me just see how it goes over in the room, maybe like a pork chop in a synagogue. Um, <laughs> I, I've wondered over the last couple of years... Is it God's will that we win all the time? You know, that outward projected winning. Or is there something that God might teach us when we lose in a more public way? And maybe how our character is shaped and the witness that we give while we are suffering 
in loss and we don't get our way actually shapes our character to where, where there's a Jesus on a cross who looks like he's losing big time. To every other estimate, to every disciple who followed him, it looked like loss and failure, and this is not the plan. This is not the way it's supposed to go. And yet you and I are sitting here today benefiting from it. And I'm just here to tell you that we go through that process too. You know what's a crazy scripture in Hebrews chapter 5? It says that although a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. Don't even get me started on like the, how does the second person of the Godhead, the all-knowing, the omniscient, the om- om- how does he learn anything? Right? That's the stuff of theologians right there. That's the how many angels can dance on the head of a pen. Did, you know, did Adam have a belly button? All of that kind of stuff, right? But listen, that, that identification with the suffering of Jesus. You know, it's like that, uh, I don't know, maybe Paul got it or not. He's like, I die every couple of weeks. You remember that when Paul wrote that? I die occasionally. Don't let me pull your leg. Yeah, come on, some of you who know it. I die daily. I hope to introduce to you today, I maybe just forgot it, um, but the whole upside down worldness of the kingdom of God is that we die to live. We die to live, and then I die some more, and I live some more. And I live with actual greater quality of life and true love and value in how I lay down my life to the one who laid down his life for me. It's the only thing that matters. And it doesn't matter the cost. See, that's what we said when we got saved. We were just coming out of desolation. Yes, but some of us didn't get saved that way. We just got saved on feelings instead of actually dying to self and living to Christ. You're welcome. <laughs> Pastor Buzz killing the house. Because in the season of desolation, everything's not awesome. As a matter of fact, it's more like this. Hello, darkness, my old friend. <laughs> now listen, once you understand that God works like this, And he speaks in the darkness. And when I don't know where to move or how to move, you know, my mother-in-law is blind. And moving furniture in the house is problematic. Because she has figured out how this thing operates. Right? And so when we move furniture, well, guess what? When all the lights are turned out on you and I in our senses, and Pentecostals, we do love feeling stuff. It is like our whole, there is a whole thing called the theology of experience. But when it overrides and makes the Christian walk all about experience, we are losing big time. It's going to be easy. As soon as I can't get goosebumps, I don't know if there's a God. <laughs> oh, see, I want to help some people today. I want to help some people today because when you hit this wall, Jesus is still there. Come on, somebody. Uh, Jesus is still there. As a matter of fact, I'm going to make a case that in some ways he's closer than he's ever been before. He is like he was in the beginning over that formless void where there's no light, there's only mass. And it says, and the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the deep. And what I'm telling you today is for some people, the Holy Spirit is hovering over the face of your deep. And he wants to speak a word that creates, a word that defines, a word that brings structure to what you're going through and his purpose and what he's doing. But you got to be yielded and still and say, Lord, whatever you want in this season, do it. Do it. Paul was having it in Romans chapter 7. He's like, okay, I've I've got this thing figured out. This is how I live the Christian life. I do the right thing. And then he said, and then I did the wrong thing, trying to do the right thing. He said, okay, maybe the Christian life goes like this. It's, I don't do the wrong thing. Yes. And then he says, but I set out not to do the wrong thing and did the wrong thing. And I'm telling you, it's one of the most schizophrenic passages in the Bible. He keeps going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And it, it 
comes to its culmination in this statement, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And then he enters into praise in one of the most beautiful chapters in the entire Bible, Romans chapter 8, which not only has stuff like God working all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose, but also that neither height nor depth nor breadth nor length nor things... You know how Paul just keeps writing, bringing it all together. He will leave nothing undone. Nothing can separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. But he would not get to write Romans chapter 8 unless he had Romans chapter 7. We don't understand the grace of God until we understand our sin. If we make light of our sin, we don't understand the measure of his love. See, when God takes us into surgery without anesthesia (laughs) to actually show us what's in our heart while our ribs are cracked open, and we're like, no, don't touch that. He's like, yeah, but there's a tumor. It's got to go. Yeah, but ah... That's why some of us don't go to the doctor, right? No, I did, something might be wrong. The, look, there's all kinds of wrong. There, we just need to own that our hearts are like squirrely. They are fleshly. They will seek pride. They will seek affirmation. They will seek just feelings as idols. I mean, just we, we do that stuff. And we're like, but I'm walking with Jesus. Yes, and there are temptations. There are temptations in Christian ministry where we get off. And the Lord says, time for a season of desolation. Time to show you who you are. I mean, Paul does this over and over and over again. We're hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, not forsaken. Struck down, not destroyed. Each one of those is a different season he was in, and he discovered, I was in that season, and now I'm out of it. And I discovered something in that season. He will not leave my soul in Sheol. See, when Jesus was in the garden and he was struggling with that, if there's any way for this cup to pass from me. Now, if you just think that was script, he was reading out a prophecy in order to fulfill the things, but he wasn't really feeling it, you're off. He felt it. In his flesh, he cried out that way. It was a real temptation. He cried out, but he got to the place. He suffered and he learned obedience in what he suffered. And he said, not my will, but yours be done. You know, in those moments, we don't know where God is, but I feel like we're Jacob sometimes, where it's like, surely the Spirit of the Lord was here, and I didn't know it. See, I I believe the Holy Spirit is near in that hovering over the face of the deep. That's why I can walk through the valley of the shadow of death and fear no evil, for he's with me. His rod, correction, and his staff, direction, comfort me. Even in a season of desolation, I get those two things. And I have the promise of resurrection. I have the promise, I can pull up out of this. Some people don't. And it's when they give up. Do not become weary while doing good, for in due season you will reap if you do not lose heart. Is all Jesus is to us winning? Winning, winning, winning. In Psalm 139, it says, Surely the darkness will overwhelm me, and the light around me will be night. Then verse 12, he says, But even the darkness is not dark to you, and the night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are alike to you. So when I feel like the darkness will overwhelm me, no, it absolutely will not. God is shining his light, but we can't perceive it, at least not until we are still Still yielded, exposed, humbled, open, transformed in the dark by the glory of the Lord. Our eyes open to the reality of the light of God in the darkness of this emotional and spiritual crisis. The Lord is teaching us a new way to receive comfort and his goodness in the dark. He strips away the layers of the propped up idols of self-image based on so many other things than I am a soul in the presence of the Almighty. At the, my bare necessity, at, at the essence of my core, I'm just a soul. Dallas Willard wrote that the work of God is the creation of a beautiful soul over time. You and I are in the process. We're being prepared for eternity. And these seasons, God is always at work if we'll let him. 
And sometimes we kind of get forced into that season. It's like, I didn't choose this season. No, you didn't. He did. You didn't choose this fast. The Lord did. And he's doing it not to bring shame to us, not to bring condemnation to us, to, but to bring light in a different way than we're experiencing it. So what do I do? Because that's what we definitely want to do. We want to do something. Uh, let me encourage you not to pull the declaration and confession card out of your, your, uh, of your belt loop too quick. Because as Pentecostal Charismatics, one of the things that we can do when we start going into the season is we try to confess our way out of it when the Lord is wanting us to be, shh, 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 I'm trying to say something. I'm trying to say something. And, and I can be using those things like magic words to just get the feelings back instead of be still and know I'm God. Be, see, I'm still trying to control outcomes. If I could just do this thing, then I could do... And by the way, the way you are going to end up back into that, going back into consolation, you'll be doing all the scripture. You're going to be doing all that. You're going to be wrestling with the devil in the dark. Because he's going to be there too, going, where's your God? Where's your God? And you're going to be quoting some scripture. He's with me always, even to the end of the age. Why should this be any different? Oh, where's he now? Where's he now? I'm not giving up. So there's going to be some wrestling in the dark. The devil won't just let that go by. But if all you do is fill the air with your words and don't listen for his, you're going to miss it. He can't get a word in edgewise. Okay, so, so who heard me say, don't declare and confess? All right, I want to be clear, because we're going to do all that. But we need to do all of that. It's like Paul said in uh, 1 Corinthians 14, let all things be done. Let it all be done. Let it all be done. And part of this wrestling with the Lord in the dark, guess what happens? Oh, he was here and I didn't know it. It's a new way. It's a new way. In the void and in that silence. So... Uh, let me invite you to this prayer, Psalm 139, 23. You know what? You probably don't want this prayer, so I'm going to have to triple dog dare you to do it. Um, okay, it's Psalm 139, verse 23. Search me, O God, and know my heart. You're like, duh, he already knows my heart. Okay, well, guess what? Uh, David's giving him permission. That consent is necessary as free moral agents in this life. God will not force us on it, uh, force it on us. God is not like some people in the world who capture people and then drug them and keep them drug, drugged on this experience to get them addicted in order to get them to do what you want them to do and hold them captive. Do you understand what I mean right there? God's not just going to drug us to make us obey him. He wants it with our full mind, with our full heart, with our full intellect, with all of it, to willfully choose to follow him no matter what. Amen. With the promise, he's not abandoning my soul and shield. No, no, no. This is God's good work. In the dark, when I can't see anything. Exactly. Exactly there. All right, search me, O oh God, know my heart. Try me. Try me. You know what try means? Test. Test me. And know my anxious thoughts. Some of that anxiety comes in the dark. Am I good enough? Am I? Oh, that's in. I don't want him to see it. I don't. You know what? Jesus was able to touch the leper without leprosy coming onto Jesus. Your sin does not alienate him. Right? The, the, the being real in his presence and allowing him to see that and confessing it openly. You know what happened to Paul? Paul said, I had that experience. I was in this dark night, and I discovered I got all these weaknesses, and I spent my life as a Pharisee, and maybe some of his life as a, as a believer, trying to like still be good, 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 and I'm, I'm killing it for Jesus. I'm hashtag winning it for Jesus. And I discovered something. He told me one time in a, seri in a period of desolation, my grace is sufficient for you. Now watch this. Paul has such an experience with this ability to be able to confess his weaknesses, and he didn't go on Facebook and share it. He wasn't like, oh, look at all. He, he didn't, like Augustine writes his confessions, and some of them are like, yikes, Augustine. But it's not about being public. It's about in the presence of God. He said, you know what? Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses 
so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. He said, I found out something. When I get in there and God shows me the wickedness that is in my heart and I agree with it, the power of Christ is like all over me. I feel his presence and his enabling power to become more than an overcomer. To know that neither height nor depth nor things created, uncreated, and all that can separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus. He learned it in the dark. And he said, I'll go back in the dark. I'll talk about my weaknesses because it was never about my weaknesses. It was about his strength. My value wasn't based on me and what I did, but about how good he is and what he has done and what he's doing to me right now in the dark. He's faithful. He's faithful. Therefore, I delight in weaknesses and insults and distresses and persecutions and difficulties. How many of you want that on your refrigerator? <laughs> in behalf of Christ, for when I am weak, then I am strong. When I am weak, then. When I am weak, then. You want to be strong? Got to be weak. You want to get up in the kingdom? Got to get down. This is the topsy-turvy thing of the kingdom of God. It is so un-American. All right, now listen, I'm wrapping up here. I'm landing this bird because I want to get off a plane. Um, <laughs> Psalm 30, verse 5, weeping endures for the night, but a shout of joy comes in the morning. Only one problem. He didn't tell us which morning. <laughs> the point is, there is a time for every season. And let's do the last graphic, please. I call this choose your own adventure. Don't we love that customization? The last graphic is me searching Google to try to find out, like, what is in my... I can't draw this. Um, the mature Christian... By the way, the actual engineering and whatever science this is has nothing to do with what I'm trying to say. Um, but in terms of ebb and flow, the mature believer is on top. And the person who hasn't yet figured out how God works is on the bottom. And that may look more exciting, but for the people in your life and for you, it's destructive. The shocks on your life can't absorb all that. Okay? That's painful. And some people are trying to talk to you like, hey, quit living like that and try something else. But when the believer on the top understands, oh, this is, this is part of my growth in the Lord. This is how it is to walk with him in seasons. This is what it's like to be in the valley of the shadow of death and fear no evil. This is what it's like to be struck down but not destroyed. That you get to the place where you engage God at that level and it didn't take you as long to get there because you understand, it. oh, ha, ha, ha. This way. So I learned in the dark that I must win. I must win so much that I put Madden on easy to win at PlayStation. Um, I ain't got no time for difficult. If it's 100 to nothing, I don't care. I won. All right? I, I got to win. I need a win. When I, when I feel like I'm not winning in life, I need to find some way to win. I'll eat a whole chocolate cake. <laughs> I will win. Okay? I learned that was a stronghold. I learned where it was rooted. Now, I didn't learn it in consolation. I learned it in desolation. I learned that my sarcasm had to go in ministry. Remember the time uh, God was, or I was having a conversation with a guy who was my best friend in the army. We got on staff together. I was a senior pastor. He was an assisting minister. And uh, I was talking to him over here, having our own conversation. And someone overheard me being sarcastic, playing around with him. Now, I grew up like that, okay? I grew up with like, my, I'd knock on my grandma's door and she's like, get in here, you idiot. And that's just the way, and it was love, some of you know what I'm talking about. You grew up in a very sarcastic household, let alone the word sarcasm in Latin means tearing flesh. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, that happened, and then somebody who overheard our conversation, I'm not bitter about it, I'm totally resolved now, um, but overheard and got like secondary offended, and it's like, oh, how could a pastor talk to somebody like that? No, we're going to leave the church. Oh, we're going to tell blah, blah, blah. I'm like, go then. Um, <laughs> But it put me in a pocket of desolation. And the Lord said, that's got to go. And I'm like, um, I don't think so. 
my best friend's little daughter, her mom used to say, go clean your room. And she'd say, mm, no, thank you. <laughs> you ever had that? The Lord step up on you and you're like, mm, no, thank you. I'll take my happy, happy Jesus who always gives me everything and I never have to sacrifice anything. I never have to. And, and let me tell you something. I had great pride in my family upbringing. You know, most of them were godly people. <laughs> and um, and it's just kind of the way we rolled. It was, and for the Lord to call on me to give that up because someone defended it over here. <laughs> Being real. And I love the way the ESV puts this. Josh was going through conquest and the Lord says, devote that city for destruction. See, in the, in the time of desolation, the Lord is searching our hearts, trying our ways, and He is devoting some things for destruction. So this leads me to the two final questions that I have for you. Here is a great way in a season of desolation to start interacting with God so you can get through it, do what you need to do, and get out of it. Number one, ask the Lord, what am I here to learn? I mean, I'm here. Don't be the Pentecostal who's like, I am not here. I am not here. I am not here. Okay, you're there. Just own it. I am in this spot. It is happening. That's called confession. You know, it's calling it like it is. I'm in a season of desolation. He did it, she did it, I did it, whatever, everybody did it, nobody did it. I'm here. I'm here. Okay? What am I here to learn? And the second question is, and what do I need to burn? What am I here to learn? And what am I here to burn? I've said a lot today, but the most important thing that could be said was whatever the Holy Spirit said in your heart. That thing that bubbled up from the inside and the Lord said, ah, got your attention. Let me, can I shine a light on something? And he didn't shine that light for condemnation. He did it for transformation. He did it for redemption. He did it for restoration. He wants to help your marriage. He wants to help your work life. He wants to help all of it. But there's some things, and when I say burn, I mean sacrifice. I did not want to give up sarcasm. And I have found sometimes I'll slip back in and the Lord says, ah, ah, ah. I can't use you like that. And by the way, that sarcasm can tear at your kids and your spouse and other people. And you know what I mean? That we give offense in nothing. Well, who wants to live like that? Jesus. Jesus does. I noticed something in the Old Testament is that the, the glory didn't come until the sacrifice was made. And when you and I determined to make that sacrifice, sacrifice what? Ourselves. <laughs> I'm a living sacrifice, right? I'm the one on the altar. But I don't have to fear death. I'm not, losing sarcasm did not kill me. It did not make me someone else other than I was, right? I still like chocolate. Maybe the Lord could deliver me from that, maybe. But um, you, you understand what I mean? L let's stand together. So let's do this. Standing up, it's, it would be hard to write anything down if you haven't written anything down anyway, but I found something that helps me. Maybe it's because I'm getting of an age now. But if I want to remember something, I say it out loud a couple of times to try to help myself remember. What is that thing that the Holy Spirit said to you? We're going to close our eyes, and what I would like to do is have us just mutter that to the Lord, just to remember, you are asking me for this. You have shown me this. And then we're going to commit. We're going to make a commitment before the Lord. Lord, whatever you want me to do, I'll do. Okay, let's just take a minute right now. Lord, that thing that you have spoken to me is, and just mutter it, just under your breath, to the Lord. Lord, that thing right there, if you've devoted it for destruction and I'm in that season of desolation, I agree with you that it needs to go. And in my own strength, I can't do it. But Lord, I thank you 
that you have identified something that's been holding me back from greater intimacy with you, from being used by you even more, from, from just stopping my own progression in spiritual growth because I won't give it to you. But Lord, today I commit myself afresh and new to you. You are my king. You are my master. I will obey you from the biggest thing to the smallest thing because you are king of kings and lord of lords. You are the lover of my soul. You're the kind father whose breath is right over me, the deepness and the darkness of my soul, ready to agree with my confession of faith and transformation in the dark will start happening. The glory to glory to glory process can then begin as we have agreed. It's not the devil doing it, it's God. He's in our deep right now. He's whispering to some of you even now, inviting you to follow him. Come on, there's a resurrection. There is a res Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I do have a plan to prosper you, to give you a future and a hope. Thank you, Jesus, for your faithfulness to us. And then when it doesn't feel like you're working, you're working. When it doesn't feel like your promise will come to pass, it surely will come to pass, and we will reap if we do not lose heart. If we do not... This morning, we're not losing heart. Come on, make that confession. I'm not losing heart. I'm not losing heart. I will see this season through. Weeping endures for the night, and a shout of joy comes in the morning. Lord, if that morning is a season away, so be it, but I will walk with you faithfully. What does it mean to obey you in this season? Show me what to burn, I'll burn it. Show me what to offer. I offer myself to you. <laughs> every foolishness, every piece of just ridiculousness on my part. I ain't much, Lord, in one manner of speaking, but I'm what you called for. And so I give myself to you. Lord, I pray that a spirit of condemnation is absolutely eliminated from this place. That you did not come to condemn. You didn't come to shame. You came to envelop with your love in the dark and to give purpose and hope for a brighter tomorrow and a, re a resumption of consolation in the dark. Oh, you're faithful. You love us so much. Amen.